On this episode of The Truth on the Houndsman XP Network, we are doing a prequel show. A couple weeks ago, you heard John Strickland and Ashley Oxendine talk about big country and some of the winning that he did. We had a lot of requests for a backstory behind that. And in this episode, I sit down with Donnie Walston and Steve Burkholder. And the three of us talk about the beginning of big country, where he came from, the breeding behind him, why he is so controversial. Uh, We just discuss a lot of things and we talk about some dogs in his historical past and other great teams of blue ticks um, and handlers that faced the same kind of scrutiny when they were hot and they were rolling. So this is the backstory. I think you're going to enjoy it. We got it out of order. Uh, it was just due to logistic stuff. Josh had the availability to sit down with John and Ashley, and we couldn't get everything pulled together with uh, Steve, Donnie, and I to get to get the original episode. But you're going to enjoy it. The old South Dog Box is rocking. It's time to get it open and hunt some big country. It's time to dump the box. Have you got your stuff set up? Mm-hmm. How's come you got that mic so far away from your face? Well, you I had to take talk? me a drink of whiskey. Oh, my whiskey. <coughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you brought you brought whiskey, but you left it in the truck. Well, hey, I got trained by you, so. Actually, uh, yeah, we'll get everything all adjusted here. Is that wind going to be a factor, you think? Is Makes that, it all Is that just me breathing heavy? It's you breathing heavy. <laughs> It's authentic, makes it authentic. Now, Burkholder, are you going to get all wound up or you're going to have to make me get on this volume and stuff to try to keep you straight? Well, they say this is a truth series, so. This is definitely the truth. The good thing about this wind is when we do get all wound up, you won't be able to hear the heavy, the nose breathing and everything else that I always have to edit out. <laughs> You tell me where you want the mic at so you don't have to edit. Your if I told you where I wanted that mic, <laughs> wouldn't be able to edit there. We wouldn't be able to publish a podcast, Steve. Yeah, see if this no, we've been trying to put this one together for a long time. So we're going to call this the Big Country prequel, the truth, the prequel. The first half. The first half. And every, people know, Don, know, know you, Burkholder, Steve Burkholder. The, how long you been? How long you been competition hunting? Well, I uh, I moved to. Uh, you're gonna Angola. have to move. You're gonna have to. I moved to the Angola. Um, let me let me help you there, sweetheart. Yeah, hey, there you go. There now you can still get your cup to your face there and you it's still pointed at yeah, you. I wanted to make I wanted to make make this high tech stuff. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not quite used to that. You don't want to we'll spill any of that good bourbon down your That's shirt right. there. That's right. We didn't. Eat, you, we just got you hooked up on how to listen to a podcast. I know that's that that in itself is kind of a tough deal. But uh, no, I moved in the Angola, Indiana area in 1990 from Wisconsin, and uh, I believe it was in '91 uh, when I started uh, competing. Uh, as a kid growing up, I think I went to uh, a couple water races uh, yeah. there at, at home, you know, and uh, but. Uh, but I've probably been following these hounds for, well, over 40 years. I started, I think, seven, eight years old when I started with uh, started hunting. And then we got Donnie Walston to my left. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I know we've been we've been trying to put this together for quite some time now, and it's you know nice well, for you, the three of us to be together and be able to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, Donnie, it took two years. I mean, yeah. Chris has been doing this podcast for two years so i'm not sure if they really want a story here or if they just was running out of material and wanted me and you to come you know well definitely hope we can put something together here it's worth (laughs) broadcasting and it works out (laughs) i have my (laughs) could be a little questionable i don't know well donnie the reason the reason you're the reason why we're sitting here because of a dog that you had and uh then all of us got in on it, and 
Let's see. Let's see if we can recall this story and all have the same version. How how did how did that all come about? The as far as the three of us getting together, or well, yeah, I mean, just whole... you know, how do we want to do this? Do we want to? I think we start with. The, I think we start with where big country came from, and I'm I, don't be getting a big head, but uh, it's already big enough. At least you're not wearing that damn Bengals hat tonight. Jeez, oh, Pete. That's well, terrible. it's not Sunday. I mean, and they're I'll, losers. I'll break it out Sunday. They're five and four right now. Are they calm, winning? Calm down. Winning record this year? <laughs> that's like the no wonder you, all the Bengals fans are celebrating. That's the first time in a long time. Um, I'm all I'm going to say on that. Say, I grew you up. You got to be tough to be a Bengals fan. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, I, uh, it's easy to be a Steelers fan, but you got to be tough to hang with the Bengals. All I'm going to say this year on the whole Bengal uh, bandwagon is uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and that's all I can do is refresh your memory, Donnie, on missed field goals. Oh man, I was at that game. <laughs> I was at that game. My <laughs> sister, <be> brutal. <laughs> my sister rolls her ankle as soon as we walk into the stadium. Breaks her ankle before we even get to our seats. She's she's upstairs for three quarters suffering through it, and I wouldn't leave. So I go up there, and she can't even put she can't even stand. I said we gotta we gotta get some help from security here. We get her out in a wheelchair, and as that debacle's taking place, I'm out in the parking lot listening to you know the roaring and cheers in the stadium. <laughs> I'm missing it all, and have to listen to the overtimes on the way home on the radio. So yeah, what a what a mess that day was. But but anyway, back to big country. Um, I'm not sure where to even even start at there, but well, the thing the thing that I think everybody needs to know about you and Blue Ticks is I don't. You've always impressed me with the knowledge you spent your whole life studying ads and books and and all kinds of stuff and and knowing what you were looking for and and what are some other dogs besides Big Country? You've had several that have gone on to. Well, I, I wouldn't say several. I mean, I've, I've had a few. I've had, I've raised a lot of blue ticks. I mean, that's always been kind of my breed of choice because that's primarily, you know, where I started as a kid. You know, my probably the real first coon dog that I ever got to experience was a, a direct son out of Harper River Joe, um, that my dad was able to purchase from our good friend Kenny Cone. Yeah, and I was probably you know twelve, thirteen years old and experienced that hound, and and he was a. I mean, super coon tree. I mean, he was a outstanding coon hound. So, at an early age, I got to experience some good dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, so early on, my my expectations were that bar was set pretty high. And I guess a, a lot of people probably don't really know who I am. You know, I've not been one to go out there and, and competition hunt. I've I have dabbled around in a little bit you know when i was younger and with no success primarily because of the dog that i took i think but uh it just my expectations of what a hound should be is, is what i've been chasing my entire life and and big country you know met those demands and i guess i was just lucky enough to you know find a couple guys like yourselves that seen the same same talent that that i did and i was willing to admit you know that I could only do so much. I took the dog as far as I was capable of doing it, you know, and we got to a point where we realized that the two of us, you know, probably got to that point and that's where Steve come into the picture. Yeah. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of <laughs> I'll tell you. probably useless information between A and B there that a lot of people's not going to care about, but you know, I, it's the, th- the thing is, I think they, I think they do care about it. Uh, I think it's a cool story because I've told several people, over the years of being in partnerships and different things on different ventures, I mean, besides my marriage, the three of us, I think that was the best, one of the best partnerships I've ever been in. Well, I'll admit, and I agree with that 100%, you know, and I'll admit that I was extremely reluctant to even go down that road just for that fact right there that... 99% of the partnerships that I've seen usually usually fail. And, you know, I know when we we discussed it, your relationship with Steve through the Hoosier Tree Dog Alliance, you know, mm-hmm. you had, uh, you know, a background with Steve and was familiar with him, I, more so than me probably. I remember meeting Steve when I was young, probably teenager, maybe younger, when, at Russell's. I don't know, you know, I'm 40 years old. You just told me you're 48, so – we're talking a long time ago, and you wouldn't even remember it. But 
I remember well, Russell it, talking about you when I was a kid and hunting with you a lot. And I, when me and Chris, I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but when me and Chris talked about it, I immediately called Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Steve, and because, you know, I trust Russell with, with everything, and his opinion means a lot to me, and he told me 100% that's the that's the – the the right guy for what you guys are wanting to do there's there won't be anybody better and in that he was 100 percent right and it worked out well going back to russell um he had a little female many years ago that he hunted that was a good female i don't remember what he called her bonnie probably. bonnie yeah um and that would have been back when i had my droop junior dog and uh see droop junior would have been i would have uh, whelped him in 96 so that would have probably been around 98 99 uh 2000 i actually hunted with russell quite a bit then and uh, so that would be you know that'd been 20 over 20 years ago yeah so i remember when chris you know got into blue ticks and at that time i'm in the middle of building building our home my wife and i were in a little rental house there my oldest daughter was just born, you know, got a lot of things going on. And Chris, Chris texted me out of nowhere. Hey, I, you know, I know you've hunted blue ticks for a long time. He said, I just got a pup. You want to get together sometime and go? And I'm like, yeah, anytime, you know. And yeah. I told my wife, I said, this is a little bit odd. I don't know if I'm getting set up here and he's wanting to try to arrest me for something or what. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to, how I feel about this. And of course, you know, we went hunting and, and hit it off and, you know, long story short, you, you know, we, you seen, you, you got to hunt with a, a young, wild version of big country at that time. And you, and, and I think you've seen the first night you ever hunted with him, you've seen the potential that was there and the things I didn't that like I was him. telling you about. I didn't like him. That night we hunted up the holler down there. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't like him. I really didn't. <laughs> but let me, let me tell you, let me tell you, I was hunting my boon dog um that night which and, was a plot mm -hmm. it was well a you got to start somewhere <laughs> yeah and uh what is wrong with you <laughs> anyway but no i seriously i didn't i didn't care for him and then he was young that year that was the year the first year that um uh, i had jazz and we went we went hunting and I mean, he 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 had some potential, but as far as he was two, you know, or he wasn't even two yet. He wasn't quite two years old yet. Yeah, I don't. You know, time gets away from me. You know, I don't. But yeah, he was young. But the thing about him was, uh, he did some good stuff. He did stuff. He wasn't afraid to take chances and and different things like that. But the way I got back, the way I got involved with him the way we got together on him to begin with was I had just about burned jazz up. Yeah. I was hunting her too hard and I knew that she needed a break and you were trying to build that house and I went and got him and, and, um, you said, yeah, I'd like for somebody to hunt him. I yeah, went and got I, him. I knew he's doing me a favor and doing the dog a favor. Yeah. I mean, it's a win, win for me. Turned him loose the first night and he was a different dog than what I had hunted with before and i was like donnie this dog is way <laughs> too good to be sitting behind your barn and farmer's retreat i remember the text you'd sent me that next morning or or maybe that night i probably still have it saved on my phone that this dog well let's see let me think about this for a second i don't want to get it mm -hmm. wrong but this dog runs a track like a plot sounds like a freight train hunts like a walker if he's got more gas in the tank than what I'm seeing, this sucker deserves to be on the cover of a magazine. Yeah. <clears throat> and we knew that. We we realized that. Or, you know, it's – he – of all the dogs that I've raised, I mean, he was the epitome of that total package, you know, that I'd been looking for my whole life. It just, uh, you know, timing just wasn't real good for me. And I, and I, and I need to mention that there was a – a few month period there that some friends of mine, Ryan and Jeremy Whitaker, mm -hmm. talked me out of him, and uh, you know I was they at brought him a back. Point and and yeah, those boys give me give me their word that you know if they was at a point they wanted to sell him or whatever that you know I, I could have him back and and they and they did that you know so th they didn't have to but they did you know so a couple good guys there you know that had him and and got to have a little fun with him so yeah I was fortunate to get him back. 
so we'll get into all the big country stuff, but I think to close out, you know, just to kind of wrap this part of the conversation up, you know, I hunted him there for, I don't know, I made him a night champion and made him a PKC champion and, and then. Well, we did. Yeah. Huh? Well, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, See, remember that night we were hunting him right up here? The night when won his night yeah, champion. Yeah, that kid just couldn't hardly – he couldn't believe what just happened to him. <laughs> they had been pitching in on us all night. They'd been – and it was a UKC hunt, and it was like as soon as he opened his mouth, they had dogs that would cover, and they knew they were there, and they knew they weren't going to be able to hear their own dogs. So I mean, this was just a matter of just a few minutes at the end of the hunt. You know, it was over. There wasn't but about ten minutes left when, you know, when all that happened. Yeah. It was right at the end. Yep. I just he located and I put him on the card and you were like, Holy crap, I can't believe you treat him like that. <laughs> and and I knew that he was I, I knew about where he was at. And you we, knew the woods and knew yeah. right where he was and Yeah. We walked in and he had a coon and that sealed it up for him and then You but, had a good night at the at the uh Labor Day classic with him. Mm-hmm. I know. I think I put a win on him down at Dupont. You know. Uh, yeah. And then we yeah. went to that. Remember that regional qualifier we went to in the middle. Of, I don't know what it was, July or August. It was ninety degrees and ninety percent humidity. And yep. Yep. Finished him out there. Is that where he finished? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We both we both won our cast that night and qualified for the world hunt. And yep. Yep, that's true. He was hunting jazz. Mm-hmm. And then. Um, Remember the night we drew each other at Portland? For the, that was before we were partnered up on him, I think. Mm, yeah, it might have been. That was that was at the Spring Classic. Yeah, or what they call that, that Spring Roundup or Spring Classic yeah, or something? I was thinking it was Blue Tick Days, but maybe not. No, it was a Spring something. Yeah. It's the, the hunt that, that the BBCHA and BBOA put on together. The reunion. When, it was held at Portland one year, I believe. Maybe was it, it was They call reunion. it the reunion? Yeah, Blue Tick Reunion. I believe they held it at Portland one year. Yeah. About yeah. around that time frame, probably. And that was a shootout from the beginning to the end. I had to do a little slick handling to get ahead. Yeah. And I uh, had to talk it, talking one of the other guys out of quitting. Remember that? <laughs> Remember that kid that was – he was hunting a good dog, too. But that, he, well, that was a nice little walker female, and I thought that uh, – I thought – I mean, I, he, he had pretty well control of the cast and just a couple bad breaks and mistakes just kind of – Put him he out made some bad there, calls but, and picked up some yeah, minus. And, yeah, but he really started off on fire, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, we are going, what is going on? You know. And uh, I think he was down 250 or something, 250 minus. And uh, I said, you know, this is this is a blue tick hunt, and you're hunting Walker. And, and he's like, yeah, I think I'm ready to go home anyway. Yeah. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Well, I remember he had a young – his son with him was pretty young, trying to keep up. And, you know, which wasn't a big deal, wasn't a factor. He but ended up staying with he us. He stayed with us and he walked did. the whole time and, you know, commented on, you know, those were a couple probably the two nicest blue ticks he'd ever seen, you know. And, yeah. And really ended up having a nice hunt. And I think Jazz, I don't know what she ended up with. It was, I think, over a 1,000 or right there. Or, I mean, we treated, I treated so. a bunch of coons that night. Yep, it was a shootout from beginning to end. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you would have beat me if you hadn't known country so well and been hunting with I guarantee you. That'd be the only way, I uh, promise you on that. Yeah. Guarantee you. <laughs> guarantee you. No. We, we're not even going to get into the clinics that I have put on in these hills and hollers around here. <laughs> and I'm going to miss it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And then and then we kind of got, got to the point where – you were busy. I was working, started a new job and working another job, and and we knew that he needed to be in better, bigger, on a bigger stage. And I think part of it is neither one of neither one of us really wanted to do that. Well, I I think me and you will both agree. You know, the we're the two oddballs here when it comes to competition hunting. You know, the two yeah. of us. I mean, I, m me especially. You know, would would rather pleasure hunt. You know, by myself with a good one-year-old you know you like making dogs a, you like making dogs I, I i that's what i enjoy you mm -hmm. know that's kind of my thing right now and that's my lifestyle and you know the time that i have it just kind of really fits fits where i'm at right now you know I, I i i'd like to get there someday you know maybe when i'm you know close to retirement or something be out there and hopefully steve's still out there in the circuit i can compete against him a little bit but we'll see i i hope to be there one day but but right now that's where i'm at 
And then here comes Steve Burkholder. Yeah, the, the, the man. I the called man, you. The legend. I called you. <laughs> Actually, uh, what really happened is uh, I've been fortunate over the years and hunted some really good blue ticks. Um, had some that won a bunch. And um, the last really good female I had was a little female called Gypsy Lady. And when she died, um, I had went through probably, had made probably three or four grand nights and competed a little bit on the, you know, as I got older, you know, as you guys know, my work schedule was always tough, so I couldn't go to, I never really cared. There isn't anybody that's a harder working guy than you, Steve. We know that. Well, I don't know about that, we, but, but, <laughs> but, but I will share this. You're the only guy I know. <laughs> Donnie and I were talking about this. You're the only guy we know that will call us and then tell us you're too busy to talk. Well, <laughs> that happens sometimes, you know. But, uh, but you know, as I, as I got older, uh, I enjoyed hunting. i be honest, I enjoyed hunting a lot of the bigger hunts. And uh, a lot of it wasn't, you know, a lot of the bigger hunts and uh, where the good dogs was at wasn't in UKC. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I wanted to compete on them levels, and we did. We've been very fortunate. But uh, probably about 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, I actually uh, kind of got frustrated looking for a good one. I mean, obviously, as you guys know, I live in uh, heavy blue tick country uh, up there where I'm at. And uh, just could not find some something that had that extra gear or was going to compete with them. You know, and them hunts, you know, once you start hunting some of them hunts and, you know, there's something about going out and drawing one good coon treer, but when you got to beat three good coon treers, that's a little different level. And, and I'd been looking and actually started, uh, actually hunted quite a few walker dogs, but, you know, I started out with blue ticks at eight years old and it's always been my heart to hunt a good blue tick. And I remember uh, laying in how country kind of come into the picture for me is I was laying in bed one night. And my oh, wife. Oh yeah, I forgot about uh, yeah. this part of the story. My wife, my wife had been on me for about a year. She wanted me to get a good blue tick, and I said they don't make one like that. I said I've hunted with them all. I've tried them out. I said if I get the right one, I would, but they just they're just not out there. And she would surf Facebook and look at all these ads and stuff. And she goes, Hey, I'm gonna get you a pup out of this cross. And I said, Well, you can for yourself, but I'm not hunting one of them. Why not? Well, I just I've hunted with all of them behind them, and I'm just not gonna waste my time with it. And I was laying in bed one night, and she come in there, and she goes, I found a perfect blue tick pup for you. And I said, well, I'm not a puppy guy, so I don't want a pup. And she goes, that's fine. I'll, I'll get a pup off this cross if you like it. And she goes, I'll raise it and get it started, and then you can finish it. And that's when she showed me the ad, you had bred your jazz female to big country. And I looked at that pedigree, and I, I, I looked at it, and I kind of set the phone off the side, and I picked it back up. And I started looking at that pedigree, and I said, you know what? If I was to hunt one, it would be out of something bred up like that. I said, because mm-hmm. I've hunted with a lot of them behind them. And unbeknownst to me, that was, that was the end of the conversation. And she called you yeah. and booked a pair of pups. And I, didn't, I forgot about it because I think she was just bred then. And about two months later, she, call, uh, she says to me, she goes, hey, actually she booked one. And then she got to talking to a really good friend of mine, Jason, that, mm-hmm. that as childhood kids, we Jason hunted to get Jason Dilt. Yeah, he was wanting his boy had gotten old old enough and was wanting to get him back in it. And she was talking to him at church. And uh, and uh, so she called you and booked another pup. And then about, I didn't even know that it, I didn't even know you was involved with him at that time. I didn't know Donnie was involved with him. And about two months later, she said, hey, Chris, Chris called and then and said that she had puppies and that we got two females coming. I said, Chris who? And she said, Chris Powell. I said, oh, really? I said, I know Chris. And uh, that's when we got to talking on mm-hmm. it. And I really didn't think any more of it. And then pups come time to be picked up. Of course, you know, she bought the puppies. And, of course, it, now it's my responsibility to go pick them up. And uh, that's when I met you north of Indy. At Cabela's. At Cabela's. Yep. And I'll never forget it. I roll in there to get these puppies. And you get there, Chris, and you let them run around. We're sitting there talking. And. I don't know nothing about big country. I just knew what he was off of, and I'd hunted with a bunch of them dogs in behind him. And and honestly, I was not excited. I tried to get out of it, come down and get them pups, <laughs> and uh, and we got to talking. And right before you left, he you said, "Hey, you really need to come down and hunt with these pups, sire." He goes, "He he's really got he's he's one of them special ones." And I looked right at Chris and I said, "I've heard that garbage so much the last eight years it make me throw up." And he said, I'll tell you what. We good? I think so. Am I, think I on? I don't think I'm on. How's yeah, come you're not you? on? How's can come you hear me? I can no. hear you. No? No. How about now? I think I hear him. Not unless it's coming through my... How about now? Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so we cut that out right in the middle of Steve's story because uh, actually the batteries died. So this recorder has this little bar that goes up and down, and the more you talk and the louder you talk, the more the bar works, and I think it ran our batteries out quicker. Good job, Steve. Yeah, I knew Chris was going to try to get that in there in the end. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, we met at Cabela's, and you picked up this pup. I, I picked up that pup, and uh, I remember you telling me, you said, you really need to – uh, check this blue dog out, or you need to check out Big Country. And he goes, I think he's got what it takes to. I think he could compete on a, on a big level. And I said, Well, I said, you know what, Chris? I, I've heard that so many times over the past ten years. I said, I, I, I said, I don't. It's hard for me to imagine that. And uh, you said, Hey, you know what? I tell you what. Why don't you, uh, when you get free, why don't you come down? And just go hunting with him. Now, mind you, this was this would have been, I believe this would have been right around the uh, December. It was before Christmas. Mm -hmm. I pups believe. was born early November. They said perfect birthdays. Yeah, November first. Yeah, it, it was somewhere right around. They had perfect they had birthdays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it was summer uh, right around the middle of December. I'm thinking, you know, it's maybe a week or two before Christmas, maybe a week before Christmas. And I said, well, let's get the holidays out of the way, and and uh, I'll come down there and. And just hunt anyways. And I thought, you know, they're four hours south. I'll go down and hunt a couple of nights when the weather's bad up here. Really not expecting to see a lot because you have to understand where I'm coming from. He hunted plots and just got into blue ticks. So, you know. Plots is not the only thing I've hunted. I've hunted everything. Well, I'm just I've saying. So everything. I had to consider the source but, a little bit. But anyways. Yeah, I well, you made it real clear to us when you come down here. The guys, you know, these are all the dogs I've owned in the past and. You know, no, Donnie, I didn't go right quite. I didn't. I didn't quite go into that detail. We, in the beginning. Well, you did too. I knew your credentials. <laughs> you did too. You gave us like, oh, I'm I'm like the most experienced no, no, person Chris, here. No, that is not true. Okay, that is not true. <laughs> uh, honestly, I was coming down here to expect to have a good night, good couple nights, and, and pleasure out. hunt, hang out, and, and yeah, I wasn't. And, and honestly, I'd have been happy with that. And so, and Donnie, I hadn't really known you. I mean, no, hadn't no. really known you. You know, and. Uh, I'm, I remember coming down and sitting right over there at that kitchen table, and and Donnie showed up, and uh, I believe I brought two dogs, and I brought a young uh, male dog that wasn't much, and because I wanted to hunt him just just to hunt him, and I brought Tyler's uh, old Bell female, she was a good coon trier, and I think he was hunting jazz, mm -hmm. and I think you know, when you hunted country and. I think Kenny went with us one night too, wasn't he hunting? A I think Ken, he did. Kenny did go along with I us. He, he had uh, at the night. time he had the patch female that I ended up with. Yeah, yeah, it was an all blue hunt. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And I threw a Walker yeah. dog in the, the following night just to make sure that, but it but it was a young dog. But anyways, I remember hunting that night and it was not even memorable. And and it was uh, it was cold out because you have to understand it was. Ended up January probably. Yeah, it was in January. And it was cold and, and coons wasn't moving good and we treated a few coons, but not nothing. It wasn't one of them hunts that you uh remember both nights actually. We hunted uh I I believe it was well we hunted two nights. And the first night I didn't see a lot, but I did see a motor there. That was kind of impressive. But if you recall, you know, that was in back when we was you know, it was in kill season and and what I seen is I seen a dog that had a lot of potential, and uh, but man, he was reckless. You seen a dog and that's been pleasure hunted his whole uh, life, his whole and life, not been you know uh, prepared for competition. Yeah, and you know, I remember one time we we knocked we I think we knocked a coon out or something, and we pulled him off, and he went back to the same tree, and and. Uh, Another time we had he we, wasn't that sloppy. Now, 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 now listen, now, now, listen. Now, that's, that's. now listen. I remember it like it was yesterday. Okay, let's yeah, just be honest. Sure, here. but yeah. anyways, just like but, I just like I remember putting but, all the winds on him and forgot but, that Donnie but, handled him but at anyways, all. I got one. Hey, but anyways, he. Uh, uh, but you know we made some split trees and but the coons wasn't moving that good. But I I tell you what what on the second night uh, that we was hunting I'll never forget it. Uh, and you guys don't even know this, and you're going to throw me under the bus, and I really don't care. That's why. But, that's why you're here. Yeah. But uh, we had we had we treed two or three coons, and a couple, and we had made a couple of trees didn't have anything in it, including mine. And uh, Tyler's old bell female had uh, treed down at the bottom of a hill, and treed slit. I think she was empty, to be honest <laughs> with you. 
<laughs> and which she didn't do very often. No. And no, I'm telling you, that was a good how joke. Was she, how old was she when she well, brought her down? She, 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 was, she, was, she was older then. No, she wasn't that old. She's six, seven no, years she, old. Yeah, then, she wasn't probably. that old because, you know, we ended up breeding her to, uh, uh, oh, to country right. in the end yeah, after yeah. that. You know, I'm sorry. But, go ahead. But anyways. Um, I won't interrupt you, guys, you anymore. I promise. You guys, oh, you're all right. I'm used to it. So um, you guys was at the top of the hill. And I'd walk down to her, and we'd pulled country off of a den tree and had flipped him back loose. And he kind of come down there past that tree, and I had him on my Garmin. And he kind of come past there probably 15, 20 feet away. And I kind of hollered at him and just, get gone, you know, doing that thing or whatever. And I watched that sucker on my Garmin. And I'm telling you, within a minute or two, he was in there 700 yards, give two ground barks, and come tree. And I knew right then and there that he was going home with me. It didn't matter what it took. It was either going to be a partnership. It was either going to be I'm buying him outright or whatever it was going to be. And I was starting to think to myself, if he can be bought outright, I was trying to figure out who I could call to get enough money <laughs> rounded up. Because, because um, and I never forget when he come treat, he had that. He had that. He come treat on a mission. Oh, yeah. And I got up there to where you guys was at. And Donnie said, well, I'll go on into him and. I said, oh, no. I said, I'm walking in here to him on this tree. And I never forget walking in there to him. And, you know, country, when he'd get in that rhythmic chop, he'd be stretched out on the side of that wood, and that back foot would just bounce off the ground. Yep. And that sucker was stretched out. And uh, he had a coon there, and we, we knocked that one out to him. But I knew from that point that when we got back here to the cabin that uh, – he I was, was either going gonna, to Hamilton. I, I, he was. He, I was either going to own all of them, part of them, or there's somehow or other something was going to have to be worked out. Yeah. You know. I so. think that's the thing that. that well, we sat there at that table for for a good while. Yeah, and, we and did. Hashed things out, and you know, and a couple hours. I know it was way into the morning. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know, looking back at that, I think we think I think we can all three agree. You know, he was he just turned four years old, and and that's what a lot of people don't realize. He just turned. You know. The first couple of years, you know, Donna, you just kind of pleasure hunted him. And yeah. you, I know you guys hunted him in a few hunts and stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, the dog was by no, mean, no means. He was just, I know you guys hunted him in kill season. But he wasn't in shape, never really been pushed, never really been dialed in on. And I think that's what we talked about He'd that never night. been hauled up and down the road. We knew we knew by watching him hit the gate at 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I mean, I hold, him to, I hold him to Mississippi for the Winter Classic. Yeah. And, uh saw what kind of performance we had down there and, and things like that. But we're talking about pounding him on the road and that's that's where you came well, into it. I uh I, I you know, I think looking back at that what we talked about is you know, I said, you know, we have to look at it this way is 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 in order for a dog to make himself is they have to prove themselves in your backyard and on the road. I mean that's really what the ultimate dog yeah. It, it, dogs are judged by and, and as we all know all of them have good dogs until you put them in them situations <clears throat> and um so we struck a deal that night and uh, the next day he went home with me and i remember calling kim and i was all excited and and she was kind of quiet on the phone didn't say much and i got home and i said kim i said i don't know what this dog is going to be but i said he's probably the best prospect i've had since my old junior dog and obviously most people know what i thought of him and she goes, I hope he works out for you. I hope he works out for you. And she goes, what about these guys you're in partnership with? And I said, well, that remains to be seen, but I think we're pretty solid there. And, you know, over the years and dog deals, as you guys know, not, not all of them work out. That's just the way it is. And I said, I don't know how long this one will work out, but I'm pretty sure both of them guys, you can take them for their word. And uh, I remember it was February. It was cold in mean, northern Indiana, not fit to hunt. And I had a treadmill set up in the garage, and uh, I started running them on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll tell you the reason why. The first night it got halfway decent up here, I cut him loose in a pretty good-sized section. And I'm just sitting there. I'm not looking at my Garmin. And when I do look at my Garmin, he's halfway through this section. And I get in the truck, and you know, it's mile-by-mile mile sections up there. And when I get to the other road, he's already a quarter way through the next section. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew I, I was like, I'm running a, uh, a coyote dog here. Well, <laughs> so anyways, I started running them on the treadmill, and uh, I've never had a dog before this. Probably will never have another one after that. I believe it was in, <laughs> it was three weeks, probably. I just slowly built him up every day to see how far I could push him. But I remember running him two hours in the morning, seven mile an hour on that treadmill every morning and every night. That dog was running 14 miles a day on that treadmill at nighttime. 
he'd come off the end of that treadmill like he was shot out of a cannon. Mm-hmm. And I walked in and I told Kim, I said, if I can, if we can ever generate that into one package um, to where he puts it, you know, to where he has that kind of heart and puts it all together in the woods, I said, it's going to be unbelievable. And then, of course, the springtime broke and I started hunting him. And, and uh, you know, he was, I mean, he was a coon treer, but he was, he was a little reckless. You know, back then he would, he, I would, I would cut him loose in a section because he was so amped up. He was in shape. And if them coons wasn't moving, he'd, he'd zigzag through that section and I'd go the other road and send him right back through that same section. Or he'd get on the road and run down the road. You know, if there was a woods half mile down the road, he'd run down that road and then go across. And Mongo would do the same thing. That's yeah. something about those dudes. They want to get through the country. And it's they're going to take the way the to, easiest the path, easiest path way they can. Resistance. Yeah, and he would. Like, and, oh, a road. <laughs> and so I would terrible I, habit. Yeah, and I I would I got a, one of my friends that I hunted with some. We'd sit up on the road and we'd drive around and he'd sit on one one kind of one way and I'd sit it the other way and when he come to the road as soon as he'd start coming down it, I would bump him, and he'd go right on across and we kind of got that broke. But I'll tell you what what the the downside to that was. For about six months, when I went to try to catch him, if he was crossing the road, if he heard that truck coming, he was spinning around going the other way, or if he got across, I mean, he could be 50 yards from me. He wasn't catching him. But I remember hunting him when the weather broke. Which is something I had taken off of him. I had had where you could catch him a little better. Because when you had him, it was like turn him loose and get him off a tree. Yeah, I got good at just... You know, learning how to apologize and walk up to somebody's house with my hat in my hands and <laughs> knock on a door and start apologizing as soon as somebody come out. You know I mean? And I was and I was still working for the state at the time, so I wanted a little better handle because well, you wanted the, to be the able to person go home that, when you wanted to go home. The person that didn't get forgiven about being in some place they weren't weren't supposed to be is the game warden. I guarantee <laughs> right. you. Guaranteed. Yeah. I wouldn't forgive him either. So no kidding. <laughs> but no, I tell you something uh, on a sideline on that. I remember. After John had got him and was hunting him down there one night, I went down there just to kind of a side story on that. And we'll get back to this. Is I'll remember when the first time he blew that whistle and that dog spun around. I mean, going dead away from us, 300 yards going out toward a main road. And I'm wanting to get in this side by side and go flying around there. And John blew that whistle twice and that dog turned around, come right there, jumped on the tailgate. He gave him that can of Vienna sausages. He licked them all up, licked John in the face, and he took him right back down there where he cut him loose at and sent him in there. And instead of going left this time, he went right. So. Um, but that, I never got to that point with him because. So you get like one cam for right and half a cam well, for I, left. Whatever or? he work, hey, whatever he does works because I've 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 adopted it now. But anyways, yeah. if somebody would have told me when that, you know, when I when we when he was young that somebody put a hand on him like that, I I never believe it. I, I wouldn't either. John was telling me about it, and then he 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 showed me firsthand. But you know, I started hunting him that spring. And uh, we had some, we had a lot of long nights. He had all the talent. He had all the natural ability. I tell you, uh, he had, I mean, he had everything. I mean, he had, the, I mean, he had everything. He had the chrome. He had the wheels. He had the mouth. He had the hunt. It was just getting, country is one of them that, you know, a lot of people probably don't realize this with him. Country is one of them. When he becomes your buddy, he wants to please you. Absolutely. But he's going to push you as far as he can to see mm-hmm. what he can get away with. And when he realizes that he can't get away with it, he's all done with it. You know what I mean? And But he always, you know, he that was what made it fun to, when, when I started trying to get him right. And I'll never forget, it was probably three weeks into that deal. I went hunting with I went hunting with a friend of mine, Tyler Sturry, and uh, he was hunting one of his dogs. He was high on. And, and you know, the bell female that he had, she was a gold champion, and I really wanted him to breed her to uh, country. And he said, well, bring him over. I'll check his oil pressure. And I went over that night, and I'm just going to be honest with you. We had a disaster, hon. I mean, his looked quite a bit better than mine. Mine didn't look – country didn't look good at all. He treated a couple coons, made a couple mistakes. And Tyler says, I'll never forget it. He says, oh, is this one of them big wonder things that you're going to be doing, you know, that you're going to be hunting the <laughs> next, next Tyler couple years? Tyler knows you pretty yeah. well. He said, oh, is this – I'll never forget it. He says, is this one of them neck great ones that you've got? And – uh and so I kept on hunting him, and his female come in heat, and he didn't breed her to country. He brought her to something else. And, man, I was I was so mad at him over that. And uh, anyways, uh, it was about, I said, Tyler, I said, I'm going to tell you, you're going to eat that down the road. And uh, I think it was about a month and a half later, um, he called me up, and he was wanting somebody to go hunting with him. And I went over there that night and hunted with him. I'll never forget it. Uh, country treated like eight coons. 
went like eight for nine. No, another one was a big den. And I think his had treated a couple coons, made a couple empties. I do know this. He was trying to run him over with the side-by-side -side at the end of the night. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> But we laugh about it now, you know. So that was kind of how it started out, you know. Yeah. When it, that was when he started putting it all together. The thing, the thing about him that I always – liked people don't people don't get this part because it doesn't get hyped but he was just fun to be around people like that dog yeah it doesn't matter if you you know if you don't even really get to experience him in the woods just during the daytime and him tied up out of a hunt oh you he know, was people you know just, just goofy gathered he's got, around him it's like and he's just, got he just personal draws people to him and he's got people skills as a dog it's, it's well, incredible he just he was he was kind of a pain uh sometimes to have around the house too you know uh, a couple of years, or I think it was about a year and a half in, you know, we traveled up and around the road and kept him in a motel room. I remember the first time I put him in a motel room, that was a disaster. I had to break him from that. He got used to it. I actually got really used to it. Oh, he's, but, he got the name Big Sissy because he's just, yeah, he's he, just a big. But I used to, <laughs> yeah, he used to, I used to, I'd get up in the morning to make coffee and his kennel, I mean, he could not see me from that kennel. And that dog knew when I got up. He'd sit out there and whine, and or even nighttime if I wouldn't go hunting, uh, I would have to go out and and uh, you know say something to him or something, not get on him. He just wanted to know that he that I knew that he was still around there. So that was the personality of him. But that's what made him honestly. That's that's why he was what he was, you know. So you know it was um, very that, very smart hound, a lot smarter than what he gets credit for. You know, that's what people that's another thing people don't understand is the brains that he has. I mean, that dog would know if I when I you guys see it's hard to envision here. But as you walk out to my barn where I keep my feed, when I would clear the end of this outdoor kitchen here, when I got around, the, he knew whether I was hunting that night or whether I was coming out to feed. And if I was coming out to hunt that night, just by the way, just by the way I was acting, he and knew. and he knew, and he would be ready to go. And if I was just feeding, then the big dumb idiot was standing on the gate just looking all at all sprawled out. Yep, looking at you. I had four of them in my kennel at one time, and that personality's, you know, that's characteristic that I'm seeing a lot in his offspring. It's the I, same type of personality, and babe, I mean, they just babes the same way, same exact way. But you know, I hunted him that in in that April, and uh, let's 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 hold off, and I want to talk about what you what we accomplished with him, the year that you went on your run. That's yeah. I want I want to talk about that, but I want to get back to how Donnie selected this pup because it wasn't an accident, Donnie. I, you don't do things by accident. You do things that are intentional. You study pedigrees. So tell us how you ended up with that puppy at your house. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate that, Chris, but I can't exactly, I can't take all the credit for that. You know, Kenny Cohn played a big role in, in getting these pups from, from Robert Shelton. And at the time, uh, Bo Cephas was, you know, there was some good dogs out of Bo Cephas and, and for a couple generations there, Bo Cephas, his sire, Bodacious, and some females, you know, throughout that pedigree had some, had some pretty good success in competition. Uh, the Sadie female, Marks, was, you know, very well known at, amongst the blue tick mm -hmm. enthusiasts. So a, a lot of good dogs How there. How do you and pronounce his last name? Vandeventer. That may be right. It may be wrong. <laughs> How do you know. pronounce it, Steve? Vandeventer or Vandeventer or yeah. whatever. I, I, call him Mar I call him Mark, but I'll yeah. tell you I call him thing. Mark V. Uh, I'll tell you one thing about Mark. He's always he's always, he's had some good dogs, and he's always hunted a good female. Yeah, he yeah. always he loves females, but um, but I had to give a lot of credit to Kenny, and, and Kenny was one of those guys I met when I was a young kid, and and he always hunted blue ticks, so a lot of that transpired through him. But uh, you know, we had a lot of conversations, and you know, I'd had a kind of a bad run of luck here with blue ticks. I had a nice young dog you know, come up missing out of my kennel there at my old house that I was yep. really, really happy with and went through a string of some more pups and that and just, just couldn't find, you know, just couldn't come up with another decent blue tick, you know, that, that I was pleased with. And I told Kenny, he asked me if I would, <clears throat> if I'd be willing to raise these pups, if he could get a pair of them out of this cross, if I'd raise them, start them. I said, yeah, I said, that, that, that sounds good, Kenny. You know, whatever you want to do, I don't care. You know, I said, but this is probably going to be some of the last blue ticks I think I'm going to raise. I'm going to maybe try some walkers if these don't work out. 
So, you know, pups show up there at my house. Kenny Kenny meets Robert down at Tell City at one of them hunts and brings him there. And I remember, I mean, he opened the, the dog box there, and this pup, country walks out on the tailgate big you know he's probably 12 weeks old you know tall slick as a mole got slobber hanging all over his <laughs> mouth he's you know and the other pup had a curled tail and was black headed and smaller so kenny liked him he liked the smaller pup and i immediately as soon as i seen country i knew that that was the pup i wanted and uh i started them and both of them really started naturally really easy and both of them good, balanced, you know, they, they, they run track really well as young pups and, and naturally wanted to tree, and, you know, they have just outstanding pups, easy starters. And um, Kenny Kenny had some bad luck there. His, his, uh, his, his father had some bad health that year, and, and Kenny just wasn't in the mood for a 10-month-old, you know, young dog, you know, so I sold him to uh, Derek Hyatt in, uh, I believe he lives in Nebraska. Uh, friends of Robert Shelton and that group of guys out there, and and they still own a dog called him Curly, yep. a good good dog. They 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 had some good luck with him in competition, so it was a really good cross. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, but country but come from a cross of coon dogs. I mean, the whole off, litter. Face would have been a litter mate, litter mate and sister, I, and Derek owns that female too. And, and I remember them guys when I first started hunting country talked about Face and and, and West yeah. Hamilton. All them guys said that's probably you know they. That was the that was the dog they was talking about. And that was a littermate sister to him. Yeah, and and Roberts uh, Robert had a female he called Lottie uh, that his grandson titled out, and you know so that that was a good cross that produced a litter of coon dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I'h I'm, not, I'm when not sure did I answer the question, or I'm not sure where I was even no, going. No, no, yeah, uh, the question I remember. Was, how how do you end up with him and yeah. and that's and where that's, he came from? But you knew the thing is though. I mean, if you look at his pedigree, what are some of the well th- going back to that? Kenny and I had many conversations about some of the breeding and that, and, and most of the dogs that I would acquire or get, you know, that I would fool with, you know, come from Kenny or recommendations from him, and I would pay attention, you know, on the message boards or you know, it was kind of before the whole Facebook scene and all that kind of you know blew up, but. Um, you know, and the reproducers list and pay attention to who's doing what in the hunts and that. And just, you know, that kind of information I can retain. I can't tell you, you know, what I did yesterday, but a lot of that stuff I can remember. It's kind of like the radio game and music. Nobody wants to even come close to challenging me when you're riding in a truck and, and listening to music. I mean, I can't be beat. And some of this blue, some of this, some of this coon hound information is the same way. It's relevant information. It's useless, but I can remember it for whatever reason. So I was always, I was always good at that. But you know, we knew those dogs primarily. I'd no can experience you sing? with them. Can you sing too, or you just like music? Merle Haggard's right in my wheelhouse. Is that you right? Me on a karaoke machine. Me and you get along just fine. <laughs> No. But, but those dogs I had no experience with other than that they, there was success there, that there was a string of dogs there that the bit female of Richie's well, on his I, bottom side is one of the only platinum champion blue tick females. And then, I, you know, the dogs that placed, got in the finals of the world hunt. So we knew there was something there and thought, let's try it, you know. But they was primarily, you know, out west, you know, Wesley Martin and them guys that had Bodacious I, and the Bocephus dog, Texas, Oklahoma, and that neck of the woods. I never experienced any of them, never been around any of them. Well, you know, I tell you, when you showed me country's pedigree, because uh, the first time I really seen the pedigree was when Kim had showed me the litter of that, but I didn't see his extended pedigree. But, you know, I've been fortunate over the years, been in a position where I've been able to travel uh, pretty much all over the United States. I remember when I was hunting my junior dog, I believe I hunted him in 18 different states. And, you know, I had a lot of knowledge of the dogs behind him because I got to hunt with – I was very fortunate and got to hunt with a lot of them. You know, the old sugar female that Joe Remmer hunted for Warren Hasser, you know, that was a coon – I mean, I competed against her. I mean, and she – when we when I drew him out, she was a dog to beat because she had, she was just a good, solid, you know, coon that, treater. That would have been Mark's uh, – Sadie's mother yeah, exa- that was bred the Rambo, too. Exactly. One of the good and crosses I remember, on Rambo, too. That- I remember being on a cast when uh, Lonnie Smiley had Rambo, too, up at the Ashland Spring Hunt, and I remember seeing him go, and I, I hunted with Sadie, and, and that little, you know, bit female. I mean, to me, I mean, I, in, the, in the blue tick world, I mean, I just say it how it is. Uh, the bit female is, is one of the top three, if not the best blue tick female 
uh, to ever draw a breath. That's just my opinion. A Frog Creek Whitey, you know, I, yeah, I hunted. Whitey with, you know, I hunted. I hunted. I hunted. I hunted with him and hunted with Bodacious one night. You know, Bodacious, he would slide. He would just slide through that country like one should. You know, and the dot female that uh, Daniel Smith hunted. You know, that was just a good solid country. So. You know, looking at that, you know, uh, Echo 2, uh, I remember long time ago, I think it was Boaz, Alabama or somewhere, uh, drawing Echo 2 out. I was spe- spectating a cast, and, and you know, they, them dogs all had one common theme. They was coon treaters. No matter where you hunted with them, they treed coons. And they was, they had, you know, they was awful good about having that coon when you mm-hmm. got there. And, and so for me, you know, I, I honestly, hey, Obviously, as you, all of us know, we, I mean, none of us can really take any credit for, you know, there was a lot of guys that bred good dogs to good dogs, and and and, and what a lot of people don't realize, country's no accident. Right. There was a lot of good, good guys. Those good crosses are you know, scattered Shelton, all throughout his three, category. Three, four generations of females, of, you know, you know, they, good females, you I, know. I think people, you know, the smart people out there that, you know, are blue tick enthusiasts and, you know, are – interested in competing at the you know that level and, and chasing these world titles you know if, if they pay attention and and pay attention to some of these good crosses on him there's a young dog you know down south i'm not going to name any names for warn any unwanted attention to them guys but out of a really good cross and i an 18 month old pup down there just you know lights out right now and he's out of a really good cross that has good litter mates if people pay attention to those crosses and utilize those dogs in the future moving forward and and breed the the good dogs out of these good crosses i i think that he can potentially help this this breed it's not going to happen overnight we know that let's and let's um let's talk about that let me part. pump pump the brakes a little bit yeah until... <laughs> just just pump them just a little bit because i want to cover Nobody knows about the run that Steve went on with that's him. Good. That's worth talking about. In what was that? Nineteen, eighteen, seventeen. Was, no, was uh, it seventeen? Seventeen is no, when. What, yeah, was it seventeen? Donnie knows. Man, I, I you know honestly I don't know. I, I mean it could be you would know. I I just know seventeen. I know it was in April. Uh, you uh, you won it, your first cast somewhere around April May. It was it was black it, and it tan was, days. No. Pe- no, it was actually I, I, I share. I mean, and a lot of people don't know this. I, I put country in eight straight hunts in April of that year. I got him in, in I believe it was January, whatever February, sometime around that time frame. Hunted him and I put him in eight straight casts and lost every one of them. And it was just our hunts around the house. That's because you're a poor handler. No, it wasn't. Hey, <laughs> but but I you could see and we, and we was, remember that Donnie he, and I were talking. He was just we getting his him feet to the right play? competition, I, getting you know well, learning the ropes and no, no. But you know it was thirty dollar hunts, and there was some things that I that we needed to get right with them, and and you know it wasn't worth for me to win seventy two dollars when I knew the potential there, and and he it wasn't that he did a lot, a lot of things. It was just little things that he would do. Uh, and then, you know, for me, if it was 15 minutes left to go on the hunt, the $72 didn't mean that much to me because I knew the potential behind it. And I remember, I vividly remember it. Um, we was, I was hunting in Michigan and, uh, Brandon and Rebecca calls at their club up there. And this was the last cast I lost with him before I won one. We had cut them in there and he just slid through there and treated coon. I mean, just like that and, uh, flipped him back off of that and, uh, Brandon's female had got treed behind us, and we went to her, and Country and another dog got treed right to the right of her, which leash-locked everything, and we went to Brandon, uh, the dog, she had a coon, we went over to them, they had a coon, and I, we walk them a minute right back to where you treed that first coon. Now, we're about 100 yards from that tree, and we cut him loose, and he goes right down there and just drills that tree, and I got mad, and I went down there, and I said, you guys can scratch me out of this hunt or do whatever, but I said... Uh, this will be the last cast, you know, that this is going to happen. And he wasn't bad for that. I'd hum around the house, pleasure hunting. He would never go back to the same tree. And I went down there and got him off that tree, and we had a we had a come-to-Jesus readjustment period. And when I cut him off of that, I remember it vividly. He treed three more coons, just pow, pow, pow. And, uh, but I was out of the hunt, but I kept c- turning him loose. And when I got back to the truck uh, the next night, I, I think it was Wyatt or one of them hunts right around the club, uh, had a hunt and it was it was april the 27th or 28th i put him in that hunt and uh, i mean he absolutely just dominated it 
And uh, that was the first cast that he'd won for that year, competition year. And from that point to September the 30th, I think we put, I think he won somewhere we around. We made a gold th- champion. Well, he made, um, he, uh, I know in, just in the open hunts, uh, just in the open hunts, he won right around 3000 or $3,100 state money. And we never hunted him, if you guys recall. Uh, we never hunted him, really. We come down to Labor Day Classic, hunted one night. We, we decided to pull him, get him fresh, get his legs back under him, and save him for the world hunt. And that Labor Day Classic, I mean, is, you know, yeah, the that week was, of that Labor was, Day. So. That was, and yeah. so we never really – I think I hunted him in two or three hunts in September. Is that the but, year I ran, ran with him at Labor Day Classic? No, this did, would have been after the fact. Okay. Um, did you hunt him at Labor Day Classic? I hunted him one night down there. Okay. We and, knew uh, if we could get in two or three nights that I'll we be possibly honest, could have I, won the state well, race. Well, I'll tell you exactly. It didn't work out. I'll like, tell, exactly, tell you exactly what happened, okay. I, is, uh, it's about we time went, you came clean. And, we went there. I, I'll be honest with you. We went there and hunted. And remember, I wanted to guide. If you re- if you really want to know the truth, I wanted to guide and come down here. That's it. And have you, you guide know, me. And, and PKC wouldn't let me guide. They said, you know, since since you wasn't hunting the dog, I said, if I'd have known that, I'd have put you down as a handler. Right. And I had to go over and hunt some other piece of property there that somebody else was guiding to it from Kentucky. And honestly, I got up the next morning, and I told you guys, I said, I'm headed back home. I said, you know what, I've... You know, because you know, guys know how country hunted and stuff. And, and here we had an opportunity to literally drive an hour from there and hunt yep. down here. It takes you know, one hour you know, to get there. And, you know, and hunt down here where he's used to or whatever. And I went home. And that, but, but he was, he was, he was wore down a little bit. But, you know, backing up to that year, uh, in the month of May of that year, he won a truck. He was, he was the overall, um, he was the overall, um, he won a truck ticket. Yeah, twice. Well, uh, twice. That's the run, but, this but, is the run I was wanting to yeah, talk about. But yeah. but in, with with that that a lot of people don't realize, um, that was the year that Blue Tick Days was in Bellevue, and we won the high dog of the month that. But along the way, we took the weekend off and went and won Blue Tick Days. With it's him. absolutely right. Won King yeah. of Hunt at that Blue was, Tick Days that year. That was right around the same time my youngest daughter was born. That's why I wasn't there. Yep. Yep. And then. Well, uh, hey, it, we need to put the wheels back on this thing. You're getting too scattered out here. No, I'm. Did, did, well, did we skip something? Because no, no, he he. When I started hunting him, I uh, hunted him in that in that May when he started out. We he won High Dog of the Month, um, and then he won Blue Tick Day. We took right. the weekend off. He won Blue Tick Days, um, and you know, back then they didn't have the hundred dollar legacy hunts. You know, a lot of these was in the thirty and fifty dollar hunts. You know, and I went to Black and Tan Days that year. Tri-State and, uh, Jamboree. In, in, in the, yeah, the Tri-State Jamboree was actually in May. Got in three of the four nights there. And then uh, Blue Tick Days was the following weekend. And we took them to Blue Tick Days, won Blue Tick Days. And then at the end of the month was Black and Tan Days. And that was back when they did double headers. And um, I, I, uh, I, hunted them, I hunted them all every night, double headers. And uh, Saturday night early, uh, he won his cast. And uh, we felt like we had enough money to win to, to get a truck ticket. He ended up winning it overall. And then the same year, they had the Michigan Summer Madness uh, in that August. And he won, um, I think he got in four out of the six nights there. And he ended up winning high. He won, he won the high dog of the month, the month for won more money than any dog in the open hunts in August as well. So, so. that year, we, we led the national race two months, right? Correct, yes. Yeah, we had we he he won the dog of the month or whatever you know mm-hmm. where they two different months where he won I I don't know one month he won eleven or twelve hundred and then, then in August he won uh, twelve or thirteen hundred something like that you have to go back and look yep. you know yep. um you know and then obviously the hunts around the house and I you know and I will tell you something uh, to debunk the theory that uh, a lot of people have the myth that you know you can win these hunts uh, without plus points and all that. You know, that year in all the casts that he was in that he won, he won one cast with circle points. It was in July, and we walked into a big leafy tree and couldn't find it. Other than that, every cast that he won, he had plus points, you know. And, uh, you know, that was that was the thing with him. I, rem- I remember being in a cast one night, and uh, I'm not going to mention no names, but they was talking. Uh, this at, is the at, truth. You can well, mention all the names well, you want. <laughs> we, we was sitting around there, and, and uh, people was talking about how hard he would go. And, uh, Just call them out one you know, on one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, country, country would, but I tell you something that uh, that a lot of people don't realize about him in hunts. That dog would take and and if there was coons around you to tree, he tree him. 
two, three, four at a crab. I remember one night, our hunt at uh, out of our club. Uh, my a real good friend of mine, that's nicknamed Smokey Carlisle Miller, was in the cast hunting a little female called Crazy, and uh, we we scored on seven or eight coon on our hunt, and uh, I mean, and country treed four of them, and uh, they well they treed one coon right out of the truck, uh, together. And then he treated three more singles, just bang, 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 and we never got over five, probably six hundred yards from the truck. And but other dogs was treeing coons too, you know. And that, I'm, you know, that I'm was telling you what, man, that dog. When you took him out of the truck, he knew where he needed to go, and what he need. He his nose was in the wind as soon as oh you got him gosh. out of the box, and it's he like knew he could which count. direction he wanted to go. That it, that myth of you know everybody knows you know he's got a big motor. You know he, it's not a secret. You know, but a lot of people associate that with the dog being a hot nosed dog putting coons up bushes no, and that's not would, him. He, that's that's not you how could lead he is. him you could lead him past three coons walking deep to cut him loose somewhere and he'll go he'll tree the coon in front of him. you and he'll tree all three behind you. Well you know it was a craziest exactly. he, he was he's the first dog that I probably the only dog that I'll ever hunt that I've I've said this to a couple of people and they thought I was goofy. Um but that dog had a couple things that a lot of dogs don't. He he would hunt every season different. In the summertime, you could take that dog and cut him in big timber, and he was going to find an edge, and you would never find him in big timber the rest of the night. And in the wintertime, you could line four dogs up and racehorse them down a lane beside the edge of a woods, and when he hit the edge of that woods, 50, 60 yards, he was cutting through that timber. He knew... Top shelf hounds know know where to look for a coon at different times of year. There's well, no question about that. What, and he he perfected that up there, especially where you're at. Well, he did. You he know, did it. Adjusted. He, he did it everywhere. You know, before I hunted him, uh, before I hunted him, you would hear the you know you would hear the term, or even on, even for me, this is what I thought: if you got in a cast and you only scored on one coon, and it was kind of luck. But when you're hunting one that you win 80% of them casts that that's the only coon scored. He, it really, it really, uh, it changed my, it changed my thinking. You know, some dogs just have that knack of figuring out where that coon is. They have that knack of figuring out where to go to find them, you know? And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, I remember CHKC world when he made the, when he made the, the final, when he made the final three, um, that late round cast, uh, I was beat. I mean, I, I was beat all night. We, I, what, I remember our conversation I, the next I, morning. I, you know, we had we had cut them dogs loose. This was after after a- Ashley owned him. Uh, we'd cut them dogs loose, and um, they they I had I know Topper was in the cast, and I don't remember the other two dogs, but I remember Topper, and uh, Bobby Bird or uh, no Zach was hunting him. Topper's and a good one. He's a real good one. I mean that dog. I mean it. I mean, them, them coon treers win because they tree coons, but we put a coon in the ground. And as you guys know, country got squirrely in the ground. And and the the round before that, he had treed a coon in the ground. We walk literally after the hunt is over, we walk a mile to him and he's got a coon in a bulldozer pile. And we walk in there and when I handle him out of there, which I can't even and I have to have this coon to win. When I handled him out of the ground, that coon is about two foot in front of him. Now, the guy that's in the cast, that's leading the cast, knows it's over when we get to that bulldoze pile. Because, I mean, he's in a bulldoze pile. I mean, a big one. And we get in there, and I pull him out, and that coon is three foot in front of him. So, I mean, I thought to myself, I mean, what? that's luck. And then we go to the late round. This is the hunt to get in the final three. And we walk in there, and they're in the ground. And in country, I don't tree him because I know it's not right. And I'll never forget, I'm struck for a quarter. I don't tree him in. And he's coming in and out of the ground over there. And these uh, these dogs, a couple of them have grabbed a slick tree right beside there. And Topper gets minus 100 and 100. And, and a little female's not there. She's struck for 50. And she's gone. And I can't tree country now. You know what I mean? Now I, here I am caught. Now what do I do? And they pull them dogs and flip them back loose. And he stays and mo- monkeys around on the ground over there for probably five, ten minutes. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. But about like that, he comes right past us. I get pumped a quarter on strike. <laughs> and everything is going to be struck for a quarter. Now, the little female that struck for 50, and, tr- and she's treed for 100, we go to her. She's got a coon. Late round, we're in t- Tennessee. And you, as you know down there, uh, that's tough to overcome. And I watch him on my Garmin going, I mean, he's gone. 
I lose signal on him about a half a mile in there. And, and Topper blows way through there and gets treed. Struck for a quarter, treed for 100. I'll never forget it. And we go to him, and he's got a coon. And he pulls him off of there. Now the female that struck for 50 and treed for 100 is treed again. And the other boy has withdrew at this point in time because I think his dog come back to us or something, but he's out of it. And the little female, she's way through there, back not too far from where she's treed his first coon at, and she's treed. And I asked the judge about putting a stationary on her, and he says, he says, I'm not going to put the stationary on her because she's so far in there, but we'll walk that way. We're going to have to condense this a little bit just well, for time's sake. So. Okay. So anyways, make a long story short, Topper gets – Topper gets treated again, walking straight away from her. Now, up to this point, I'm not, I'm not even struck in. We're three quarters. We're probably got 35, 40 minutes left to go in this hunt. And, and it, I pick him up on my garment. It shows him and he's treeing, but I can't hear him. And we go to Topper, and when we get about 200 yards from Topper, you can hear him treating behind him. And I strike him and tree him. We go to Topper. He's got another coon. We go down the country, and he's treed behind this trailer park. And he's got a coon. <laughs> no oh, lie. my gosh. I he, could tell a story hey, about that. And he's creeped behind his trailer park. And now, mind you, when I pull him off of there, there's like five or six minutes left to go in the hunt. And I can't turn him back loose because we have to hear this female. Topper's not struck. But Topper has to have a coon. He has to have another coon to win. And I'll never forget, we walked 200 yards back out to this blacktop road. And we're walking down the blacktop road to walk back to where we heard this female at. And I know our run is over. And I'll never forget it. We, uh, Zach says, hey, can we stop and listen? And when we stop and listen, as far as you can hear, you can hear Topper treat. He strikes and trees Topper, and the judge says, cut him. And when I cut him loose, there ain't three minutes and 30 seconds, maybe four minutes left to go in the hunt max. And he runs right down the middle of that blacktop road, goes about 50 feet and spins around and comes running right back between us, right down the middle of the blacktop road and is gone. And he goes back there, and, of course, the minute's up on Topper. There's like two minutes left to go in the hunt, one minute. And he just falls treed right back there where he treed that coon at. And I zoom my Garmin way out. I strike him and tree him. You knew he and wasn't on the same I tree. I knew he I wasn't remember, on the same tree. I remember tree, yeah. talking about it the next day. And I'll and never me, forget yeah. it. I'm telling I, you, this is it, Steve. You're going to do You guys hey, are going to pull this I, off. I, it's I, meant I, to be. Hey, I strike and tree him. <laughs> and they send Zach. They, so they said, hey, since we're right here, hunt's over. Now the guy that struck for 50 and 100, now he's – trying everything in the world he can do to try to hear his female, but she's a mile and a half the other way. And he could have treated her for an hour in that hunt and didn't. And hunt runs out, and the judge says, I'm going to score him because if he's got a coon, you, you know, obviously Topper can't win. And I remember walking in there, and it was right behind his trailer court, and there was, there was, he was treed, literally. We stepped it off. He was literally treed 15 feet over from where he treed that coon at. And I showed him the coon that he treed, and he had another coon there, and that's what. And, wow. and, he, and he knew that coon was there. Yep. You yep. know, I'm but telling that's, you, he that's could just, count. That's he what he knew was. You know? He could keep it. Hey, before we before we get to the final part, I'm gonna ask you guys a pretty good zinger question here. But I'm gonna share my <coughs> share my qu uh, story about the trailer park thing. You remember that night that I was hunting? It was Christmas time. And I sent you that text. I'm oh, like, yeah. Like, how's yeah. it going? <laughs> and I said, I think he's just uh, taking a tour through the neighborhood looking at Christmas lights. It was right at Christmas time. And that sucker went through yards and everything else out here in this in this neighborhood that had all these blow-up things in the yard, those Christmas decorations that had the fans and they blow up. I swear, I think that dog was doing the Christmas light. He was just out joy riding He was on the Christmas <laughs> light tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that dog was entertaining to hunt. Yeah. So, all right, here's a zinger. Why is he so controversial in the blue tick breed amongst blue tick breeders and blue tick fanciers? Why? I, I well, yeah, I, that's a tough one. I mean, Steve I, probably going to be able to answer that better than me. He's been around the blue tick well, world longer than I have. That's a good question, and and I think it brings us to. Uh, you know, our conversation, uh, you know, obviously my, our conversation that we had, um, you know, obviously selling that dog was going to be the toughest thing that any of the three of us done. And, you know, we talked about it. And, uh, you know, hey, being around the blue tick breed all my life, um, uh, I knew, uh, and, and this is just the way it is, I knew that that dog, because the way he was bred, um, had, a, had a, an amazing opportunity what he could do in the stud pen. But because of because of the because of what we're going to talk about here, 
I think we all three knew deep down inside that if we owned him, they was probably not going to breed to him because because of the, you know, uh, unfortunately this is just the way it is, and I'm just going to say it the way I see it. Um, uh, there's a lot of people within the breed uh, that are scared to death that somebody else is going to get recognition. That's just the way it is. And, you know, going back to it, going back to that part of it, uh, we all three felt uh, when we sold him that if he got into somebody that was not like a p typical. Uh, remember this conversation. Uh, you know, and I remember you guys because I know you guys was dumbfounded when I told you guys that when Wes Hamilton put the whole deal uh, together on Ashley buying him, uh, I said, you know what, uh, he's obviously – that that point in time before they got him, he'd proved that he could win. He was already making a name for himself in the in the in the competition world. And it wasn't by us sharing that with him. It was he. We had the ability where we put him in enough big hunts where people from like, away from the breed started seeing what he was capable of. Because you know when you I, judge, a hundred percent feel like we did it the right way hmm. and let the dog advertise himself. Well, you know when you have guy, you know this is I've always shared this, you know. Uh, the great dogs from the past was revered uh, by people from all breeds, and that's what he was doing. You know, there was there was a lot of guys that knew what coon dogs was, and and, and we never had to brag on the dog. The dog bragged yeah. on himself. You know, it it was, and believe me, I, I I hunted in them hunts, and I watched it unfold firsthand. But you know, when guys would hunt with them one or two nights in them casts and stuff, and they was telling their buddies and you know about him, and uh, you know, I just we just knew that if the, the, the we just knew that the dog had a amazing opportunity what he could do in the stud pen because hey guys you can't deny what his breeding well part you of, know part of that too was we were getting those calls and i had i think i eventually started kicking them over to you donnie because because i didn't want to deal with it but then you try to kick them back to me <laughs> and, and but i mean everybody <clears throat> the expectations are so low but that's that's that is my take is is the expectations are so low for what can truly be great. And maybe every person that turns a blue tick loose will stop listening to this podcast after this episode, but that's the way it's going to be because this is the truth. You know, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> there was a post put on Facebook about the historical reproducers list, the current list. My jazz female is on that list. Yeah, yeah. And she's got two... No, she's got four pups that are that have put her at number five on the list. But he, so so the expectations are so low. But but when you start putting him out there on those stages of with people that have won, I mean, what's halftime Ruby won? Has she won two hundred? Oh, two hundred. I mean, total with the two twenty. Well, with total with the invitation and stuff, she's won over three hundred thousand. Yeah, three hundred thousand dollars. So these people know. And she's not a blue tick, and these people know what it's going to take to win. And they were the ones that were saying, when That's you walk in, when you walk into a major event, they're like, "Do you guys bring country?" Yes. Okay. They knew we were there every time. Well, it, you know, it, there's when, a, there's when, a lot when you have. We you know when Wes and Brett decided to to breed to him. I thought that was. I mean, that's a statement right there. And for you know, when you have Josh Michaelis and Jed Finley saying he's one of the best dogs they've ever seen turn loose, John Strickland saying he's probably better than Bad Habit, you know those type of things hold a lot of water with me. Well, and for and for the controversy that surrounds him, and it's primarily it seems like you know well, a I, lot of that comes from blue tick people. Well, and, it, it, here's what I'm gonna share with you. But uh, I'm like Chris. I I think that. Um, my opinion, you know, and it's not a knock on 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 blue tick enthusiasts, the guys that enjoy these these blue tick coon hounds, you know, because I'm I fall into this category right now. You know, I think that majority of those guys are just what I would consider hobbyists of coon hunting, you know, and and, I, and I'm that way right now. You know, I'm I'm not even close to uh, being in a stage where I'm hunting enough to be able to prepare a dog for for competition serious competition and i think a lot of blue tick people are that way you know their their highlight of the year is going to blue tick days and you know saying well we got two weeks before you know the hunt we need to start hunting a little bit and go to blue tick days and that's and that's it you know my recommendation to these guys if they you know if you think you got that dog tied up behind the shed back here 
go to the open events in your state, enter those events, and try to try to lead the nation two times in a, in a, in a year month. and get a truck ticket, yeah, or try try to read year. try to win the breed race, or try to you know compete in your state race. Everybody can afford to go to them hunts. If you can afford to go to the UKC hunts at your well, local club, it, you can go to them hunts. You don't have to go to a a sixty five hundred dollar well, or a twenty five hundred dollar uh, pro classic or you know whatever. Just but, start there and see. If you really, truly got something that can compete. Well, two things, um, and we get in these debates all the time. No, the first thing to kind of answer your question, why controversial, Tom Brady, as much as I hate to admit it, is as good of a quarterback that's ever threw the ball. And unless he was a New England's Patriots fan, it was hard to root for him. Yeah, you that's right. You know what right. I mean? Michael Jordan. No, when it I wasn't. Up, well, that's, I love sports. But, but I understand. And but, I but, don't but, like New England Patriots, but Tom Brady's but, the best but, to ever play the okay, game, and I, I can recognize okay, that and but, appreciate but let that. But let me – let, let, let me that, let me deliberate a little I'm bit. I'm not going to get on social media <laughs> no. and message forums no, and but, bash Tom Brady and say but, he's a worthless piece of crap no, that throws nothing but, but interceptions but, every but, game like what they're doing but, in the country. But, because let me let me finish on that side of it. So sorry. so naturally, okay. <laughs> let, let, naturally, let me finish. Or uh, so obviously, Tom Brady is going to probably get he's going to probably get ridiculed or criticized on everything that he does, good or bad. Period. I mean, they're going to judge him by the highest esteem because he's revered as one of the best. You know, Michael Jordan when he played for the Bulls. You know, he. You know, when you when you become a winner, you're going to get you're going to get critiqued at everything that you do because you're considered one of the. I elite. see where you're going you see with what this I'm now. Saying? I'm sorry for and, jumping and, on you. And so, <laughs> wow, that was vicious. You know, no. So <laughs> so when you get when 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 you get something like that, you're you know it comes with the territory. You're going to get critiqued and criticized, and that's okay. You know they. The reason they was good is because that you know they was able to handle that side of it. And and with, in and back to your original question, why is it controversial? Because, um, and 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 to debunk your theory on the, the fact. Oh, of, he's challenging you know, now. To, to where to where people say that the you know the myth of the behind the barnyard, uh, door dog or whatever you want to call it. Oh, you're going with that. I, I'm well, tracking now. Here's what I'm gonna share with you. Here's what I truly believe. Everybody that has a good one has an opportunity to hunt in these hunts because in the day and age and the era that we live in, there's enough guys out there right now that are looking for a dog that they can take to these hunts. So when they tell me that they have, if you truly have one of them, okay, yeah, you may have to partner up with someone, but you can't tell them, you can't bring to me and say, you know, if I had the opportunity to go hunt that $2,500 hunt, oh, you know, blue over here would have the same, or any breed what would have the saying? same opportunity. Yeah, let me, the let opportunity. Me, let me, the opportunity is there. You're not gonna let me talk. Go Those ahead. good dogs find a way to get in people's you, hands. You, you lay this out better than anybody I've ever seen, Steve. Because you always hear, "Oh, they got a." Once you get that money back in them, then that's when they. It's <laughs> it's like it wasn't real. Like their ability wasn't real. Like their talent wasn't real until they got money behind them. But you always counter with. It, every, the good ones pay for themselves. The good ones pay for themselves. The great ones make money. And the, the great ones find themselves in the right people's hands, and they're given that opportunity to compete on the big stage. And for anybody to sit here and say that I just didn't have the opportunity, you have the opportunity. Every single person, especially in the era that we're living in now, if you have one that can compete at that level, there is people waiting right now. I can put you in touch with them. That are looking for one if you think – and they'll cut you in on it. It's not like they're going to take your dog from you or whatever. Exactly. They will cut you in on it, and most of the time will let you even handle it. Yeah. But I got news for you. At $2,500 a crack or $6,500 a crack, uh, you're going to get your opportunity. But it changes when you get into them style of hunts because, believe me, I've hunted in a bunch of them. And you're not, you don't have to beat one. You have to beat three. And there's number one, there's good dogs there, and you got to have a coon treer to win. Okay, and we've seen it in the past, just in the past year. People get on there and, 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 and brag about how good and, – and they get their opportunity. And, and, and so as far as that side of it goes, the good dogs get in the right people's hands. They get the opportunity. You know, face it, 30% of these guys that go to these hunts win. The other 70% lose. That's just the way it is. And uh, so, you know, on the controversy side – uh, and, and this is just me. This is just my opinion. Uh, and we talked about it. We all three knew, you know, I, we all felt that country had an opportunity. We, once, once he proved that he can win on the big stage and the way that he did it, 
we all felt like he had the opportunity to reproduce. And, and obviously for me, uh, that becomes because of the pedigree behind him, the dogs behind him. They was coon treaters. And they we felt like the, the, the chances that he could reproduce were pretty good. But, but the jury was out. We didn't know for sure. We didn't We've know. seen a couple, you know, we, out of a couple they, of those earlier crosses, you that, know, on what jazz. They was doing. And, you know, but where, here's, here's what I did we, know. We it, was suspect of it. Mm-hmm. Here's what I didn't know. I knew that if he stayed in our hands on that side of it, and we talked about it because it was pretty tough when Ashley come to us, Wes Hamilton put us in that. I remember us talking about it. And – we just knew that if he stayed in our hands, that he wasn't going to get bred to the, the he was going to get bred to the off-colored females, but he wasn't going to get bred to the blue tick females if we owned him because we're blue tick fans yours. And we talked about it, and you can see what happened. I proofs in the pudding, you know. People started breeding to him because obviously Ashley Oxen uh, Oxendine. Well, the thing and of it John is, John Strickland aren't blue tick fanciers. I mean, all they want to do is hunt a good dog. The and thing is, Steve, people would call me and they'd be like, oh, "I got a good one." I got a good female, and we were trying to be smart about this and not just back him up to er, back anything up to him, and put the the statistics and the odds in our favor that he was going to be a good pr- reproducer. So when people would call and say, "I got the best female you ever saw," it's like, "Bring her." Yeah, we want to see her. And you know how and many they don't time, show up. You know how many times anybody showed up with those females? Zero. None. But but you know. Um, but we had a little bit different, probably mindset. You mm-hmm. know, we wanted to, we wanted you to still be able to hunt that dog. You know, but at yep. the same time, you know, if a good female, you know, that we we knew firsthand was a good coon tree and female, we we wanted to we wanted to breed them females. Yep. It well, wasn't that we didn't want to allow the public to use him. It's just that in we my diff- opinion, we had different goals at that point in his yeah. life. Yeah. People are breeding them blue ticks all the time, and in my opinion, there's probably too many of them dogs getting bred. Or, you know, and I didn't see any reason why he needed to breed bred until we knew 100 percent he's worth breeding to. Because right. we were collecting him, we were you'd had him collected a couple times. We were yeah. breeding him to a couple, trying to preserve some of that. But just this random, he and we advertise he's not up for public stud. Right, and that might have rubbed people the wrong way, maybe. I well, don't know, because that's probably not it, typical uh, again, of how guys are within their blue tick. You know, again, the guys it, that it, have these dogs. You know, they they don't care. You know, they they make them a grand night. You know, whatever, and compete with them a little bit, and they they they're open to the public. You know, you breed these dogs. It, right, it, it's, it's hard it, in as that. you guys know. It's hard to hunt one in these hunts up and down the road and and, and breed them all the time. And uh, you know, honestly, I mean. If if you really you know to, to really get down the nuts and bolts of of why <coughs> why country got bred a lot was 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 number one uh, people was breeding to them that hunted with them and they was bringing their good females to them and breeding to them and there was a few of the blue tick guys that that brought their good gyps bred to them because they hunted with them and they liked what they seen and, and and a lot of your knowledgeable ones that that understand you know I mean when you when you stack them kind of females behind a pedigree the chance of you having a reproducer is pretty good. And I, I don't but, know how many times I've got phone calls from guys, you know, saying, hey, buddy of mine, Walker guy hunted with him, you know, a couple weekends ago over and, you know, such and such wherever and uh, said he really put on a good show. And I said, if, if you can, if you ever get a chance, you ought to try to catch up, you know, and, and hunt with him sometime. Try to see him go. And that's what I would tell them guys, you know, but that advertisement from well, outside people that had competed against him. And well, the bottom line is, is is when Ash Oxenine bought him and I stayed on hunting him, um, and we got through the CHKC world that year, and Strickland had been blowing Ashley's phone up, blowing Ashley's phone up, and I didn't really want to let go of him. But, you know, it was it was after, I mean, honestly, it was after Wes, had, Wes and them guys had bred Ruby to him. And when, when Wes, you know, th- there's a lot of credit that goes to that cross being made is why country got bred the way he did. But at that point in time, there was already pups, you know, uh, the Matt Lingo's um, uh, yeah. club, club, and, club. And, yep. and, and Babe was – I was just starting to hunt her, and she was starting to win some, and Ellie was starting to win. And these was all, these was all out of his first litter. And when John bought – you know, and, and I have to give a shout-out to John on one thing as much as it pains me because he's my buddy. Um, John has never studded a dog in his entire life and said he never would. And, of course, they hunted country and had that big run, as, you, as most of you guys know or whatever. But – you know, they was smart enough to understand the opportunity that was at hand of what he could do. And, you know, I, I firmly believe today uh, the reason why he's bred as much is because because them guys own him. 
Uh, I think that, you know, and, and he's been bred to a lot of uh, really good females and, and uh, you know, the, the jury's still out on that side of it. But I mean, you let's better say, mention Terry Tappy when you mention Country Club. Just well, so you know. Yeah, I better would because he'll call me up on it. But you know what, guys? Um, we still don't know. You know, honestly, all of us still don't know what, what he's going to end up at on, no. on the reproducer. But I can tell you this, you know, based off of, you know, people don't realize, you know, today there's only 90% of his pups are two years old and younger. You know what I mean? Honestly. You know, I think Babe and them was the third or fourth cross that we made, and she's three, going to be four. Yeah. You know, and we didn't breed him a lot when we had him. You know, we bred him to Jerry. And you know what? And let's you talk. Know, I want to say probably maybe We haven't 10, got time to talk about all that. Ten females, maybe. Really, maybe we 12. don't. No, seriously. We're, I mean, we're going to have to have an episode two. I don't know. This is like we're working on the be- first three-hour podcast I've ever produced. Well, we so. can't do that. You have to break it down. Two. <laughs> but, yeah, so. But l- let me let me tell you this. So, so the way the way I look at it, it's not. People, I think people get caught up and they misunderstand that it's country, 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 country with us. And, yeah, it is because we know what he's capable of. But I also tell people, don't pass up those other good dogs out there. You know, you got Danny Perez with Woodrow. You got John Stever with Lonesome too. You got, you know, there's other there's other stuff that that Robert Shelton's got, and I'm sure Richie McDonald's sitting on something down there. And Brian Gary, Davis has got the Jessup dog. I Gary Uchman and yeah, we hunted with him at Blue Tick <coughs> yeah, Days. Don't dog. breed to them. him, but don't think don't 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 forget to bring something back. Because country can contribute something to those breeding programs. That's kind of, you know, the point I was making earlier. You know, if you pay attention to these good crosses on him to use later on down the road to Woodrow yes. or, or John Steber's dogs Absolutely. or hey, and you you know what? whatever. You know, I, I, I want to share this. You know, it, I went out and hunt. You know, John, I went out and hunted with him uh, three nights before the Super Stakes. And uh, pleasure hunting with him three nights. Had an unbelievable time. John must be a and, heck of a guy. And, I mean, and, I've never as met good him, but everybody As good of a guy as there is. And and you know what? Them dogs, I tell you what they are. They are just good, solid coon treers. Yep. Every hunt that I had with them, they're just good. Lonesome, too, is as good of a solid coon treer. Is, is he, he's one of them dogs that you just unsnap him, and he's he's got he just goes hunting. And, uh, you know, he's not – maybe you're not your typical blow in there a mile, but you don't have to. He – he, he just hunts, and I'll tell you something else. Every one of his dogs, Lonesome 2, Slick, the Cash Dog, they handle like a dream. John never puts a lead on them dogs. You can tell and, John's and, pretty passionate about his and, hounds. He spends a lot of time with them, and he's a hard hunter, you know, that just like Perez you mentioned. Danny Danny's Perez. A, Danny's a coon hunter. He he probably he don't miss a lot of nights. I mean, those, that guy, those guys are just and pure I have, coon I have Wood, hunters. Yeah, I have Woodrow here, and I saw the potential in that dog enough that he hadn't even got a title on him when I bred him to jazz, you know, when I saw saw what he was capable of. Plus, there was a plan to bring that back around. But the thing of it is, all those dogs have something to bring to the table. So, let's hey, you know nobody's what? Nobody's sitting there, sitting back here. None what? of us are going to say, don't, don't make a, those crosses. H- half-brother Botox. Yeah. That's a good dog. Yeah, I hunted sure with him. Is. It's a coon yeah. treer. You know what I mean? And and Terry Tappy, the little female he's hunting right now, is off of him and in – and um, Henry Blessing's little female, and, yep. and, that, and that's a good little female, you know. Yep. yep, guys, we could go on and on. I mean, this this, <laughs> it, and I'm gonna run it all as one podcast. I don't care. It's great. This is this is the kind of conversation that that uh, people need to hear. And I wish I could capture this every week when when people three guys sit down together that are as familiar and comfortable with each other. We can cut up on each other. We can have a good time together, and I don't regret a single single second of uh, of anything we ever did together. I, I don't. Appreciate I don't it. either. I you know I appreciate your guys's you know effort behind that behind that dog, and I'm glad that you guys felt the same way about him that I did. You know, it's that dog's meant a lot to everybody who has been associated with him and has experienced him and. You know, I noticed in the podcast you did with with John and Ashley, you could hear the emotion almost in John's voice when he's talking there at the end about, you know, after they got breeding him and he started hunting him a little bit and he wasn't quite right. And, you know, that's how yeah. that's how much that dog has has uh, affected the people that's that's hunted him and has owned him and has been a part of him. And and 
I hope people understand that that you know that's that's how special he is to to us. So, well, you know one thing, um, I was a pleasure hunter long before uh, I ever started competition hunting, and I'm 48 years old. Let's face it, I'm getting down toward the end of my competition career, probably. No, and, you got to uh, wait till I well, at least get retired. Which is and fine. I'll whoop up on you. And you. <laughs> I'll whoop up on you as well. But no, um, I, I'll say one thing. You know, uh, I would love to just share just a few minutes on uh, coon hunting in general and, and the hunts and, and the camaraderie that's come with it. You know, the winning is great. You know, all of us, I mean, obviously, you know, you show me a guy that doesn't care if he wins or not, I want to draw him every night. You know what I mean? That's just a competitive <laughs> That's just a competitive side of me. But what I will share with you is at the end of the day, uh, some of my best friends in this world I met through coon hunting. And, uh, you know, a country tied the three of us together, you know, on a friendship that will last the rest of our life. You yeah, know? Absolutely. And, you know, that's the thing that, you know, uh, you, you know, some – kind of give it a bad rap but it, i honestly believe if you go into these hunts uh with uh with a positive <coughs> attitude and, and when you hunt these hunts um you go in there uh proactive instead of on the negative side or whatever you're going to be on a lot more good hunts than ever was bad or maybe i'm just one of the fortunate ones but when you continuously draw some of them top competitors and you have good hunts with them and you become you know you 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 that friendship starts and stuff you know if the if the competition hunts stopped today, I would still uh, pleasure hunt, and I would still hunt with a lot of the guys that I hunt today. Maybe even in competition because of the friendships and the camaraderie and that side of it. Come, you know, as you get older, uh, when I was younger, you know, winning probably was a little bit more important. But as I get older, it, I look back at that part of of this whole deal, and that, and that's what I enjoy about it the most. You know. Uh, that's right. I, I agree with you 100%. There's been other people, and I think that's what people need to understand. Why are we so passionate about big country? Because it's not just about a dog. It's about the relationships we've built around the dog. And you can look back, um, you know, Russ Downing and Perry Vesley, around what they've done through dogs. Anybody that knows anything about blue ticks, knows that Russ and Perry are, you know, they're going to take up for each other because yeah. it's more than just about the dog. No, it's I, about the relationship they built friendship. around the dog. I thought about that the other day when I was, you know, kind of browsing through social media and come across a few comments and that, you know, and mm -hmm. sitting there thinking about the controversy that surrounded this dog. And I thought about Perry and Russ, you know, and the controversy, you know, with hey, Spanky, hey, hey, you know, you the things. Yeah. And I thought, here we are, you know. We're right there, you know, in the same boat that them guys are in and the same things that they had to listen Man, to and deal can, with with Spanky. But if he can years. make an impact like Spanky did, then we did something. Yeah, well, I agree. Well, let me tell you, uh, any winner of any kind in any sport or anything that you do, uh, that's going to come with it. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's going to come with it. And, uh, you know, I remember Russ Beller, uh, you know, saying this many times. He said, if they're talking about you, don't matter if it's good and bad, they're worried about you. And and you know, uh, obviously as you know, I mean, there's no there's no guy that's won, uh, owned any more world champions than him. And uh, you know, every, you know, every, when I grew up, when I first come in the competition hunts, when Beller's name come up, it was always you know, and, you know, there was always there was always that, but you know, that was always that mystique. But you know what? That comes with the territory. And, sure. And sure. You know what? You you know, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I always, you know, at the end of the day, good dogs speak for themselves. You don't have to brag on them. You know, this social media platform, honestly, uh, it's, it's kind don't of. Don't get off on social no, media. Not, don't but, be taking this on a tangent. I'm not. Over. But what I want to share with you is, is you know, um, years ago uh, when, a, when a good dog was talked about, people went and seen it for themselves. And, uh, you know, with the way, you know, people can get the, te you know, you can hear about a, a good one a whole lot quicker, but the jury's still out. But you know, when 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 people that hunt with them, when they're the ones that are your jury, that's what that's where the difference. Yeah, that's is where at. it counts. That's where it counts.